Hi, welcome to Learn SDR with Prof. Jason. Today we're going to talk about quadrature phase shift keying, which is a pretty popular data transmission standard and is kind of the basis for a lot of the, the, the standards that, that go beyond this and really take advantage of the complex nature of what we're putting into and getting out of these software defined radios. So let me review a little bit about what we saw with phase shift keying and let me put it in a slightly different uh, different language. So, so before we looked at transmitting either uh, the carrier wave or a 180 degree version, uh, rotated version of that carrier wave. So we we're multiplying the carrier wave by either plus one or minus one. And to represent that on a complex plane, we can represent that with two points here. Uh, plus one, which last time we represented, uh, represented the binary number one, and minus one, real, which represented the binary, let me write one B, which represented the binary number zero. So this meant that we had a, uh, at, at baseband, the thing we were sending into the software defined radio, we had a purely real signal that was made up of either plus one or minus one. And the imaginary part of the signal was always just zero. And we're, we're sort of losing out on half of the, the possible degrees of freedom that we could modify here. So for example, if you looked at the spectrum of this real signal, like any real signal, it would be symmetric. We're just completely ignoring the sign part of, the, of what's being transmitted and only modulating the cosine part. So this would be binary phase shift keying. Keep in mind that sometimes people define this, this part on the, uh, on the real axis as the binary number zero and this as the binary number one, depends on your convention. So today we're gonna look at quadrature phase shift keying where we, uh, where we modulate both the cosine part the, by sending in a, uh, real numbers and modulate the imaginary part by sending in uh, imaginary numbers. So we're, we'll send in complex numbers. So on in the complex plane, usually this is represented as four points. And by convention, uh, and I guess there are different, there are different conventions, but the, the sort of default convention in, in GNU radio, if you, if you uh, put down one of these, uh, these blocks, I'm pretty sure that at least in one one of the versions, there are four points and none of them are on the real or imaginary axes. There's a point here, a point here, a point here, and a point here, and they're all equidistant from the origin. They're each in, a, uh, in one of the quadrants. And uh, again, at least in one of the conventions, this represents the number zero, which is zeros, we can write that as zero, zero in binary. So because we have four points, we can encode two bits. Uh, this represents the number one, uh, zero, one in binary, which is the number one. Uh, this one represents the number two, which is one, zero in binary. And this represents the number three, which is one, one in binary. And if we put in complex waveform, that switches between these four points. And we then modulate that up to radio frequencies by taking the real part and multiplying a sine or a cosine wave and taking the imaginary part and multiplying by a 90 degree shifted sine wave. We are changing the phase of the outgoing wave in increments of 90 degrees. So the phase of the outgoing wave is, is going to, uh, uh, is going to be moving around at 915 megahertz or 2.4 gigahertz or whatever. And the difference between when we're sending a zero and when we're sending a one is a 90 degree phase shift. Okay, so there are two things you might notice about this. One is that we've chosen the points not to be along the real and the imaginary axis as, as you might've guessed if we were to extend this, but in the kind of at 45 degrees in each quadrant. 
And that choice has to do with the ease of decoding. So assuming we've properly locked onto the phase and we're, and we're getting these symbols, it's really easy to check if the, to check the signs of the real and the imaginary component and decide based purely on the signs, which of these four quadrants you're in. Whereas if we were, uh, if, if we chose our symbols to be along the axes, you would have to draw boundaries that were at 45 degrees. And that's a, a little bit harder to do. I, you know, at least historically, I think this is the reason why, uh, why these have been chosen because the going from a particular complex number to the particular symbol, anything that's out in this quadrant is just going to be three and anything that's down in this quadrant is going to be two and anything that's over here is going to be. Uh, the other thing you, you might've noticed is that the, these don't really go in order, right? It's not zero, one, two, three, it's zero, one, three, two. And that ordering is called gray code, where as we, uh, the nearest neighbors are only differ, only different by one bit. So if we start at zero and we go up, we only change the least significant bit. And if we go over, we only change the most significant bit, but uh, to go all the way across, we, we change both bits. And so arranging things like this doesn't, doesn't have any nice counterclockwise or clockwise order, but it makes sense in terms of reducing the, the bit error. So say, say you get back something that's kind of right on the boundary. If you're, if you're far away from one axis, but right on the boundary of the other, you're only gonna be uncertain in one of the two bits. And so that's why uh, the order of this is chosen in this way. So let's actually implement this in a flow graph and, and see, see what this looks like. So I'll share my screen again. And I have already saved my previous flow graph with, with the new title QPSK. And I'm just gonna make two very small changes. One is that my, my source is not gonna just be zeros and ones anymore. I have these, these four different symbols I can choose between. And so I'm gonna make a source that's, that goes between these four symbols. So maybe I'll go zero, one, two, three, and then maybe I'll go zero, three, zero, three, just to see some, some fast transitions, okay? Um, and the other change I'm gonna make is in this chunks to symbols, I'm going to look up those, uh, those indices in my list here. So now I have four different symbols that I have to write complex numbers for. And because of the way I've arranged them on the complex plane, I have to be a little bit careful here. So zero, was negative imaginary part and negative real part. So I'm gonna do negative one plus, or sorry, minus one J. That's, that's my uh, zero symbol. My one symbol was negative real part, but positive imaginary part. My number two symbol was positive real part, negative imaginary part, so not, not comma then I would have too many symbols, minus one J. And my symbol number three was both positive real and positive imaginary. Okay, so uh, now these indices are going to be looked up in this table and turned into complex numbers. And that's the only change I'm gonna make. So let me play that. And there's a couple of things you notice here. So this, uh, this clean looking graph is the graph of the real and the imaginary parts of what is coming out. Let me pause this and zoom in a little bit. So as we go through all the symbols, zero, one, two, three, we go through, uh, we go through uh, negative, negative. Uh, one of the parts gets positive. The other part gets positive. Uh, now they're both positive. And when I switch back and forth between the symbol for zero and the symbol for three, both the real and the imaginary parts bounce around. So that's, that's, our, uh, that's what we're transmitting. And we have, at, at, each, at each instant in time, we have four different possibilities. And so we're transmitting two bits at every instant in time. Let me play that again. Um, my frequency is, is kind of off in, a, in an odd way here. And I can tune it to be 
closer and closer to being the right frequency. And you can see that the sine wave gets slower and slower and slower. There's a bit of an art there. Uh, let me pause this uh, let me, and pause this. And what you see is that my constellation plot here of my real and imaginary axis, there's four little clumps. And as the, since the frequency isn't perfect, they, they all slosh between them. But there's, there's no point here, like there was with the binary phase shift keying, where I want the imaginary signal to be zero, right? There's always going to be some imaginary uh, part changes, and there's going to be some real part changes. Let me start both of these again. Again, the hardware clocks are drifting, so I sort of always have to, to keep up a little bit. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, there are some points in the center as we're making transitions, but uh, at any given instant, there's, uh, there's often just four constellation points. What, what is the advantage of this quadrature phase shift keying over, over the, the binary phase shift keying? Well, there's clearly we can transmit two bits of information for every symbol, but that, that comes at a bit of a cost. You, whereas before we just ignored what was happening on the imaginary axis, assuming we were aligned, it didn't really matter which side of the imaginary axis we were on. Here, um, we have to uh, we have to be a little bit more careful about both the real and the imaginary part. So this is a little bit more susceptible to noise, although uh, the the you you win you generally win in terms of data rate. Um, there's there are generalizations of this where instead of just having four points, so having two points or four points, we could go to what's called eight, eight PSK, where we have eight different phases. So the constellation for that might look like a point here, 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 all around in, the, in a unit circle. It's not very much a unit circle. So these are all in the unit circle. Um, or you can have more complicated constellations. So uh, a very popular pattern is quadrature amplitude modulated constellations. And here you just have a grid of points. And let's say we have one, two, three, four points in these position. So this would be 16 QAM, 16 QAM. And at every instant in time, there, there are 16 different options in terms of amplitude and phase that, that you could transmit. And so you could pack even more data into, uh, into each symbol. And you can continue this. 256 QAM is something that some, uh, some cable modems use. Where there are 256 options per per symbol, and the thing limiting you again, like the like the amplitude shift keying, is how noisy your signal is. So whether you can really distinguish this point from that point in the presence of noise, and we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about that when we actually implement the the more real version of this. So before I go on, let me talk about three problems and, and where we're going. So. And you can see all three problems if I go back to sharing the screen. So one of the problems is this carrier synchronization here. Obviously, it would be nice to have some automated algorithm to, to tune this thing and to, uh, to really lock on to a particular uh, frequency. And not, not just lock onto the right frequency, but really tune it so that these, these four points are aligned in phase the way we, we think they should be aligned, where, uh, where they're 45 degrees on the real and the imaginary axis. Another problem is the spectrum that we're sending and we're transmitting here. We are really using the spectrum incredibly inefficiently. So yes, most of the power is concentrated in, uh, in one part of the spectrum, 
but there's quite a lot that extends out. And let me show you, there might, some of these features are, are due to the fact that we're sending a particular pattern. But even if I send completely random data, which I can do pretty easily here using a, uh, I search for random, a random uniform source. So instead of sending this pattern, let me disable this block and send a pattern of bytes. And this is sort of Python convention. So the minimum is the actual minimum and the maximum is one beyond the maximum. So if I want zero, one, two, and three, I wanna go from zero up to, but not including four. And if I send a bunch of random bytes, the spectrum is a little bit smoother, but it's still quite wide. And if I right click on this and I set the FFT average to be high, it will average pretty quickly. And this is, this is the spectrum that I'm sending. So there's a peak here and there are a lot of what are called side lobes and they're not that much quieter than the main peak. And the reason is that we're sending incredibly sharp transitions. Uh, we're, and really all of the information is contained just in this main peak. And I could filter out all the other stuff and still get all of my bits back theoretically. Now we'll see how close to that ideal we can get, but we're, we're using way more spectrum than we need to. And if I smooth out the bits, we don't have these nice clean transitions to, to lock onto. It's a little bit more complicated, but we will send pulses that are not just these kind of square wave type pulses. We'll send pulses that uh, are much smoother and are much lower, uh, have much less harmonic frequency content. What that also allows us to do, it also allows us to sample correctly. So right now, I haven't really optimized where we are sampling in time. So if I pause here, it's pretty obvious from looking at it that I should take a sample in the center of each of these bits, but we haven't automated that process yet. And so all of those deficiencies are, are deficiencies we'll start, to, we'll start to fix next time. We'll, we'll work with much narrower bandwidth and we'll start to come up with algorithms to lock onto the correct frequency and phase and also to get the timing synchronization correct to, to measure the center of each bit. I will start next time. Next time we're gonna do, you know, those three things that I talked about, which are uh, shape of the pulses, we'll shape the pulses and we'll lock on to the, the center of each bit and we'll fix the carrier phase synchronization. And then we're basically done with the, the kind of simple digital communications. We can actually build a, a modem that can transmit data pretty far from, from point A to point B uh, with, with pretty narrow bandwidth and, uh, and recover the data on the other side.